Let's talk about it. 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 On the field. Hello, hello, hello. Let me start with this video regarding Arnett's my guest. Hello, hello. I am hello. so honored to have with me Miss JB Jones. And before we get started, I just want to share a little bit about her. How are you doing today? I am so well and, and thank you so much for having me on the show. Well, I'm just honored to have you and I'm just gonna take a few minutes and read a little bit about you and then you're gonna share with the audience more about you and what you're doing and all of that kind of stuff okay thank you. thank you and those there are some people trying to come on if you go to the link on jb's page you will see that that's where you're supposed to be oh my goodness uh hold on let me let me share with with the audience Biography of Jemima Beatrice Jones, author and playwright. She was born in Los Angeles and raised on the tumultuous streets of Compton, California in the mid 60s. She is an author, playwright, and she is no stranger to the literary dream. After high school, she attended San Jose State University from 1973 to 1977, where she studied business administration. The author playwright wrote her first manuscript, Bones, around the time of the movie Rocky, at the time that Rocky debuted. Now, after several rejection letters, she returned her focus to her studies, but never gave up on her dream of becoming a published author. Joan's most creative fictional piece was a short story poem entitled The King of Her Castle. Around 2004, Jones became aware of a Los Angeles based group of singers calling themselves the Jubilee Singers. And we're gonna talk more about that. And she's gonna tell us the history of that, of the Jubilee Singers, rather than me read it. Jones has been a licensed realtor in the state of California since 2005. She has owned and operated a successful tax consulting firm since 1982. And during the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles and the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, she successfully vended souvenir pins to thousands. She, was pro she has proudly served as chief merchandiser to the late legendary Ray Charles during the last four years of his career. On June 1st, 2021, Jones arrived in Nashville to launch her Relive the Legacy Tour, which included visits to the Hermitage, the Hermitage Jubilee Hall, Fountain Square, Nashville's Union Station, the Jubilee Bridge, the Tennessee State Capitol, and the Admiral fell in in Baltimore. 
On June 19th of 2021, the stars aligned and brought Jones and artistic director Rossi Turner of Nashville together. As a result of this predestined meeting, the story of Jubilee is scheduled to return to the stage in the spring of 2022. All aboard, all aboard. Awesome. All aboard. Awesome. Well, listen, I am so happy to have you here. And what I'm going to do is give you some time to just kind of share your story. I'd like to know how did you determine your passion and, um, and just share the story of that. Hello, Felicia. Before I have you do that, good evening, everyone. Hello, Felicia. So glad you're here. I'm excited about my guest, and I'm going to bring her on the stage so she can share about who she is and what she does. Okay. I'm As uh, my hostess has told you, I'm Jemima B. Jones, and I have penned the story of Jubilee. Now, I had a son who was a member of a Los Angeles-based group of Jubilee singers, and it took an audition for him to become a member of that group. And as a young teenager, he came home and said, Mom, I auditioned for and got into a group of Jubilee singers. I said, well, that's wonderful, son, but who are the Jubilee singers? He said, oh, I don't know. We dress up, we sing, and they pay me. And I thought, well, that's a short version. And it was years later that I applied for a position to work with those same Jubilee singers as a personnel coordinator. And in preparing for the job, I started to research who are the Jubilee singers. And the more I dug, the more compelled I became to put pen to paper and spread the good news, not only about the children's music, which we all know as Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Get On Board, um, if, uh, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. We know the music, but we don't know the children. And so I delved into their backstory and I learned that Ella Shepard, who was born on a plantation and, and uh, was born into slavery, was almost drowned at the hands of her own mother. And some believe that this was the first time anyone ever heard the song Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And it's the first song ever recorded by African Americans. Now, when Ella Shepard showed up at Fisk, which was the Fisk Freed Colored School when it first opened, she became Professor White's assistant, which made her the first African-American teacher on this campus. And she is reputed to have taught the Jubilee Singers the song, Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And it was first recorded by four of the gentlemen of the original Fisk Jubilee Singers, which leads me to believe that that legacy must be a true legacy. And then the my research took me to a Thomas Rutley, who was born right here in Wilson County, Tennessee. And Thomas's family was sold to a new master when Thomas was three years old. And the master would not let his mother keep him because he could not work in the fields. But the mother pleaded so earnestly for her child's life that the master's daughter said, Father, I'll take care of the child so that he could stay with his mother. And when the daughter's plantation was raided after the Civil War, Thomas and two of his siblings came to Nashville, found another sibling. His sister taught him how to read. And at the age of 11, Thomas Rutling was already a surgeon's assistant. The surgeon was friends with the Honorable General Clinton B. Fisk and gave Thomas a letter of recommendation to attend the Fisk Free Color School. And I believe he was, if not the first, one of the very first students to enroll into the university. So, now, Maggie Porter, I'm sorry, did you want to interject so something? So that was the precursor to Fisk University? Yes, uh, Fisk University was formed by the Freedmen's Bureau and the American Missionary Association, which joined forces 
uh, right after the Civil War ended. And their biggest accomplishment was establishing what we now call our historical black colleges. They put over half a million dollars into establishing those colleges, and the Honorable General Clinton B. Fisk donated $30,000 to start and to found Fisk University. So we do have to take our hats off to not only our celebrated abolitionists like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, but there's a lot, lot of white abolitionists who helped us along the way. And because these students, um, um, uh, before I go on, uh, Frederick Loudon was another student who was born free. Now he never enrolled in the fifth and he was older than these other students, but their professor, George White, did invite him to become part of the original Fisk Jubilee Singers. So now they have the group formed and the professor teaching them Stephen Foster's music, uh, uh, Swan, way back up on the Suwannee River and old Susanna. And, and the students weren't really taking too kindly to the music, but the professor would hear them when classes were over in secret singing spirituals and slave music. And their harmony was like listening to angels. So he eventually convinced Ella Shepard to pin and score some of the songs that he would hear them sing. And she did it very reluctantly because she thought it was blasphemous to, for them to add those songs to their repertoire to entertain wow. others. But she, she did as her professor asked. And they were in Ohio, I believe in Columbus, before they really, they got a standing ovation and had run out of material. And the professor said, well, why don't we do one of those spirituals? And they sang the Queen Low Sweet Chariot and it brought the house down. And from then on, everyone wanted the Fisk Jubilee Singers to come. And, to, and that was the first time that white people had ever been entertained by black music. Oh so my. they are akin to black music like Bob Marley is and was to reggae. That is so they, awesome. They put African-American music on the map. They are the soul and the heart of our music. Everything that came after them came after them. That is and awesome. So I want to acknowledge a couple people that are on. Hello, Fucina. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And um, I wanted to ask. I don't. I didn't mean to cut you off, but there will be people coming on that I want to acknowledge. Uh, I also want to ask you your passion for and all the research that you've done. Can you share a little bit about how you came to this passion and how you became so interested in becoming a playwright? Can you share that part of your story? Well, you know, I had to ask myself that. Once I pinned the, uh, the story of Jubilee did, its origin was as a stage production. And the story just became part of me. And I, I had to ask God in the universe, why me? Why did you pick me for the vessel of this vision? So I really don't understand why I was picked, but I can assure you that I have been chosen to be the one to preserve the legacy of not only the music. One of these students, Jenny Jackson, was born on the Hermitage, which is President Andrew Jackson's plantation and was a direct descendant of his. Now, oh. you mentioned uh, in the introduction that that was one of my locations I visited when I came here. They don't mention Jenny Jackson. And there's oh, wow. plenty of history in there. I got a chance to see the actual slave barracks, which have been very well preserved. And uh, I tell my husband, sometimes I think I feel like I was there and I was telling their story, even though it's historical fiction based on actual events. When I put the words to the event, I feel like I was there. So maybe one of the, I have one of their spirits. I do believe the spirits go on and, and, and inhabit other flesh. So maybe I have one of their spirits, but it's the passion I have for the story even astounds me. And it's just 
Sometimes I would tell my husband, well, I'll see you. I'm going back to 1872. <laughs> or depending on where I was in the writing. Okay, if you're looking for me, I'll be in 1874. <laughs> yes. And I want to talk about some of the other things that you have done. And, and I'm going to share that video again, um, introducing what you're going to be doing. I'm excited. I want to come to Tennessee and see this when it when it. Premier. Yes, we got to get it on stage. We have to get it on stage. That's why I'm so appreciative of you letting me have this platform because it's it's support that I need to get us on stage and to preserve I, I, my my job. My assignment is to preserve their legacy perpetually through the arts. That's awesome. And you've been very involved with artists and musicians throughout your career. And I know that you were involved with uh, Ray Charles. You want to tell us a little bit about that, and and tell us uh, and tell us a little bit about him and um, what impact, if any, he had on your life. Okay, um, when um, I come from the aerospace industry in California, which you know was a big industry, and once uh, we got equal equal opportunity became a thing. Um, most of us worked in the aerospace industry and that's where I met one of Ray's children, one of his daughters. Okay. And uh, I, I had already been involved with the Olympics. I, I did bending on the, the gorgeous lapel pins, which was a very wonderful experience. And it gave me the experience I needed so that by the time I met her and she found out that I had experience in merchandising, she asked me to go on the road, her dad, and be in charge of his merchandising. Oh, so my. That's how I got to that. Yes. And when we put the stage on, uh, the performance on stage, uh, her, Renee, which is one of his daughters, and her husband, and one of her daughters were cast members. Her sister wrote the verse to our theme song, Yes, He's Got Power. And uh, her husband, her sister's husband, was in the play. One of the Raylettes served as our music director. And so it, we have a Ray Charles connection. But what I learned traveling with Ray was how to move a group of people for a tour. And I wondered then, why do I need to know this? You know how the kids we say in school, what am I going to need to know trigonometry for? Right. I was thinking, why am I going to need to know this? And now I understand. Now because, you understand. Yes. Once I leave a, an ensemble of actors, performers here in Nashville to carry this production on, hopefully, at the African American Museum of Music, which just opened this year, uh, that's, th I believe that should be our home. Then my, my love is out on the road, and uh, I want to form a cast to take on the road, to tour perpetually. It's uh, going to happen. And, and, you know, my GoFundMe page, I'm asking for donations to save our performing arts, meaning African Americans performing arts. And then when you think about it, do we really have a performing arts project that just belongs to us? Some think it's Porgy and Bess. So did I, until I went to see Porgy and Bess and, and did some research on it. Porgy and Bess is not an African American written, directed, produced production. Porgy and Bess is it's a wonderful story. It's a beautiful opera about the town whore and the town drug addict. That's not what we want and need to represent us in the No, art. it's not. No, it's not. And and, I, and when I think about um the color purple, yes, an African American woman wrote the book, The Color Purple. But that's not who promotes it in the arts. And so it's time. We have enough, enough A-list people, uh, producers and directors and executive producers of African-American descent to put this on stage. Absolutely. And Absolutely. it's time. This is our shot. And so I'm hoping that uh, the, the word goes out and gets out into the universe. You know, people, uh, some of the first things people say to you when they find out you're trying to get something monumental like this done. Well, have you contacted Oprah? 
Have you contacted Tyler? You don't just contact Oprah or contact Tyler. You have to be in that circle, but you can put out in the universe that yes. you need some help from Oprah and or need some help from Tyler or need some help from the Obamas. And then you have to let your wishes be known. Absolutely. So, um, Absolutely. I'm trying to get that word out. And this is another avenue. And that's why I so appreciate the time, Vera, that you uh, that the Lord blessed you, first of all, to be able to figure out this technology. They're trying to leave us <laughs> as, as, as seniors. I, I could count myself as a senior behind on this technology, but we are I'm figuring it out. They're keeping up. <laughs> Well, let me um, ask you regarding the African Museum that it is in Tennessee. Yes, it is. It just opened in, I believe, in January or February. It's a beautiful edifice, state of the art theater, 200 seat theater. The Broadway entrance is called the Fist Jubilee Singers Broadway Entrance. The first exhibit when you get in there is of the Fist well, Jubilee have you, Singers. The have you yet. talked to them? Have you talked to them yet? Uh, I have emails out to them. Um, they were invited to uh, to listen in on the broadcast on the podcast with the wrong link, but um, yes, I am in communication with people on the campus, people at the museum. I just need to get them to have the same vision and the same passion for the they project will. that I have. They will. They will. Now there is a Miss Edna Young. She is backstage. Um, I can bring her up um, if you want. Would that? Would you want me to do that so that she can share in this story? Oh, that would be wonderful. Okay. Hello, Miss Young. You want to unmute yourself? That is Eden. Eden Young. E Eden Hi. Young. Oh my God. Hi, JB. Look at your hair. You're so beautiful. Girl, gotta be... Well, Eden, I, I met Eden in Los Angeles. Okay. At the Taste of LA. Okay. Well, and Eden... I told Eden about the project, and she said, I would kill to be in this production. And Eden played two roles and had her costume custom made and was such a wonderful help. Well, so good Eden, to see Eden, um, actually, this is the actual show. Um, the, vi the video that you would be watching is actually on Facebook. The link that you have is to be on the platform with and us today. Wow, this is amazing. What a treat. This is such a treat. Well, you want to tell us a little bit about you and, and your connection with JB? Well, yes, like JB said, I met her, you know, you know how things are mystic, like she said, and we got connected and um, JB has uh, not only the art of people, but the art of vision, you know, and how could you say no, right? Um, and she had this really wonderful and beautiful display and she had the song. He's got power of playing. I, I said, I'll, I'll be anything. I'll be a tree. I'll be whatever you need. Because it was so beautiful. And it was so wonderful working with JB. We had such a good time. And I learned a lot. You know, and I was really honored to get to play two roles. So I got to play the young girl. And then I also got to play um, the, uh, the, the, the mistress, right? The, the madame. The and that was history. really, yeah, uh, it was great, you know, and I cherish that, that the experience for sure. I mean, to well, be part of something like this, you know, and I think it's timely. It was timely then. And, you know, JB's ahead of her time, you know, for sure. And thank <laughs> well, heavens, right? Well, we're, thank heavens, and we're looking forward to helping to promote. Felicia says, yes, you definitely can put it out in the universe, and what you are doing is so amazing. Thank, thank you, you, Felicia, Felicia. For, that, for that. Thank you. And, yes, and um, Eden, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wasn't expecting expecting you to be on here but once you were there it's like okay um let's just go with the flow and um 
And I want to bring you back, um, JB, and just kind of um, share more. You, you are a wealth of information, a wealth of history. Well, you know, um, you know, we are fighting to get African-American history taught in the schools. And, um, and I'm all for that. But it's just a matter of using what avenue, what venue. Uh, I'm for teaching African-American history from a, let's talk about it after slavery, okay? We have pretty much all taught our children. We all know that we once were slaves. Let's pick up and see what we did after we were free. And the story of Jubilee begins where slavery ends. And that's also, that's the message I want to make sure I portray out there. I had someone, uh, even a family member who's a filmmaker uh, because I love to use this picture. I mean, there's lots of pictures of the Jubilee singers, but this is my favorite. And uh, I wanted to get her involved in the project and she looked at the picture and she said, oh, another slave story. And and that was it. And I didn't even get a chance to say, well, no, it's not a slave story, but that's where our story begins. Um, you know, And so we can't tell the African-American experience without including the fact that we once were slaves. Right. Lot, we all know that, but do we know that? Almost every single thing that was invented was invented by African Americans after slavery. Exactly. But then what we where we fall short is that we let others tell our story and profit off of our story. Why aren't we profiting off of our own legacy? Why aren't we telling our own legacy from from from, from within where we feel? the passion for it. So I, I, there's a lot of points of, especially yesterday I did a radio broadcast here, uh, WBOL in Nashville. And uh, I, I was a little shocked to hear some of the ladies, some were younger, some were older than myself. who said, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. Like, do we know that Swing Low Sweet Chariot was the first song ever recorded by African Americans? Do we know that the original Fist Jubilee singers were the first African Americans to sing at the White House at Ulysses S. Grant's inauguration. Apparently, a lot of us, some of us don't, because in Los Angeles, during the all of the uprise in 2020, they tore down the Ulysses S. Grant statue. Ulysses S. Grant is who beat the heck out of Robert E. Lee that ended the Civil War. Yeah. So, and 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 to let you know how how. Some of the other historians, when they write about him, you would think all he was was an alcoholic. Um, he was an abolitionist, but yet he married a woman whose family owned lots of slaves. But he wasn't for slavery. That's his white family. But he was totally against slavery. So uh, do we know that uh, over in Europe, they still sing Swing Low Sweet Chariot before each rugby game? No, I can only... Mm -hmm. Now, you know the history of Swing Low. Wasn't that one of the slave songs that they sang? Yes, it is. And, and like I pre premised, it supposedly the first time it was, the course of it was heard was at the near drowning of Ella Shepherd at the hands of her own mother because oh. she did not want her child to remain a slave. Um, uh, uh, do we know that? Uh, oh, and, and then I wanted to mention some of the places I went and why. I went to the Hermitage because I wanted to see where Jenny Jackson was from. And I wanted to see if they mentioned anything about that connection, which they did not. They did not. I want I to acknowledge Fucina. She says, we are responsible for our own story. Yes, Absolutely. And so why we are arguing and fighting and and and, and trying to force the white race to teach our history. No, we need to be teaching our own history. I graduated high school in the 70s, 73. And I remember the army recruiters and the Navy and all those recruiters came to try to recruit us into the military. I don't remember anybody trying to come recruit me into a historical black college, which is half of the reason that I'm just at 50, 60 years old 
realizing and finding out, oh, we have some historical black colleges? That's not good. No, and That's there are not good. There are a I didn't lot have a of school counselors suggest to me, oh, well, maybe you want to go to a historical black college. <laughs> In the 70s, there was, there was no internet. No. I'm assuming they knew. They were the adults, but no one mentioned that to me. And right. I really am shamed to say, and I feel slighted and cheated, that no one told me that we had some historical black colleges. So we need, we need to uh, make our children aware of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember my first episode of racism. I was around eight years old and our parents took us to Texas. It was our first time in the South, you know, coming from California. We, we, we weren't used to anything dealing with racism. And a little log ride came by. And I, I think I was already, a, a little girl was already in the ride, a little white girl. And I jumped in the ride, little excited little color girl and the little white girl's dad picked her up and took her out of the ride. And I said, oh, it's okay, sir. She can ride with me. Oh. <gasps> Do you know my parents never told me that that was racism? So to me, teaching our history, first of all, starts at home so that you can teach your child yourself your approach to what you want them to know about mistreatment and racism absolutely because, and and you know it, it is so prevalent now you know yeah. and our kids yeah. you know and the young kids they don't understand you know but i think parents are becoming more aware of the importance of making our children aware that there are people out here that don't like us and will yeah. try to hurt us. I want now, to I like the way you said that there there are people because it's so important to make the point that all white people are not right. Racist. Absolutely. I want to respond And I think to that's the opinion some of our young people are getting. Right. And Fushina she says she learned I learned my about my history history when I attended an HBCU. And that is where our history is taught in the HBCUs. It's a wealth of information. And it's unfortunate that there are not enough of us attending those schools, but there are a lot and they come out doing things. And you know, here in Atlanta, there are quite a few HBCUs. You know, you've got Sm exactly. Spelman, Clark, Morehouse, you know, and so, um, yes. so that- and We know how the African-American community is balling in Atlanta. I mean- Yes, they are. Yeah. Yes, they are. I have to say that. Yes, they so are. I, I do, I feel cheated and slighted. And I'm hoping that school counselors and, and uh, school teachers can hear my voice and because and and let our students know uh, there's some historical black colleges out there that uh, you need to look into at least consider but you know what anthony anderson's blackish i love that he always always figured a way to put something about african-american history in every single yes. episode yes now he's yes. from compton like i am so yes. that stuff came out of compton too <laughs> yeah, awesome. Let's hear what Felicia is saying. She says, I totally agree with you, Jemima. There was so many that things we have contributed beyond slavery, all the inventions, successful towns, and thriving businesses. We need to tell our story, the good, the bad, and beyond. We can rebuild again and become a great nation. Yes. We can, and thank you for that, Felicia. Yes. Absolutely, you know, because what's happening right now in our country, the hate that is going on, and you know, our young people are suffering from PD, PTSD and all these other things because of all this hatred that's out here now. And so it is incumbent upon our parents and adults to, first of all, instill that greatness in our kids so that, that once they are in the midst of any racism or whatever, they've got that inner strength within themselves to understand just because you may feel that way about me does not make it so. 
And often, exactly. and oftentimes, I, I am convinced that those who show hatred, they are suffering from physical conditions as well as mental conditions, you know, and, and it's, it's not, hate is not good for our, for health, you know. And it's, it's, it's a talk behavior. I was at the Kentucky Castle the other week and uh, it was on my agenda of something I was going to do to celebrate uh, a, after my last book signing. And I wore my tiara onto the property and kind of kept it on the entire time. And I was walking out to go do an errand and this family pulled up, this cute little white girl got out of the car and she said, daddy, look, a real princess. And she and I ended up taking a picture together in the lobby. I um, got over a hundred likes on that picture because that sweet little baby was looking up at me as if she, in her heart, because I was wearing my tiara and I'm at a castle, I was a real princess. She didn't see me as a black woman. She, she saw, saw you as a princess. a princess. That's awesome. Fuchina, she says the Black Wall Street is a classic example that we can have our own. There is power in unity. Well, yes, there were so many. The Black Wall Street was just one of many, many, many cities that were created by Black people that were destroyed, you know, because of that hate, you know. Isn't that um, it's terrible. My brother and is. My, you know, my sister just hit me to that to that in the last two or three years. Oh, it's. I mean, yes. almost. There were so many black cities, and Eatonville, Florida. My brother is the mayor there, and it is the the oldest chartered black city in the nation. You know, but we've got. There were just a few that stood the test of time. And All those of them were burnt down. You know, yes. I mean, what was has been done to the African American community has been a travesty, and it has I been. Like, it has been. and now, like I, you, uh -huh. go ahead. I'm sorry. I, you know what? I support my president wholeheartedly, but when it came down to him saying there will be no reparations for the people who lost their property on, in Tulsa on Black Wall Street. I was not for that. There's going to be funding and money pumped into the community. <laughs> really? Well, those people have built, you know, I, I'm of the kind of person, if I'm coming to your establishment and you don't serve Blacks for whatever reason, you have that right. This is your establishment. Just let me know what's going on so I can beat it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> And, and so I'm not trying to encroach on what you have. And so that's what those people did. They said, fine, you don't want us in your community. We're going to pool our money and start our Exactly. You're going to come burn them out. It. And then yes. they destroyed it. And exactly. there's no reparation? Come on. Exactly. Felicia says, my oldest daughter went to an HBCU, Albany State University in Albany, Georgia. I believe there is there are 10... HBCUs in Georgia? Oh, wow. wow. I didn't know that. I'm new to Georgia, so I did not know that. That is mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And you know, some of our HBCUs have shut down. They have gone broke. And yeah, you know, that's what have. these children did. Now, see, that's where their story is so empowering. They were the first generation of free slaves to go to school. And FIS was going bankrupt a year or two after they opened. If FIS had failed, they might have shut all of the black schools down and none of us would have gotten education. And that's why they went on their tour to save their school from bankruptcy. Now the school was not supportive of the idea. They felt like the professor was gonna try to get them out there and exploit them. So the school only donated a dollar, but the school had asked the professor to be the treasurer by then. And he took the money out of the little 30 bucks they had in the treasury and that dollar and borrowed some money from his friends and took the kids on tour. They got out there and started making so much money, then the school wouldn't let them come home. Is that so right? Them, yes. They were 
exploited to no end. They became ill. Thomas Rutling kept having fainting spells. Um, they came finally. They were out there 18 months on their first tour. Oh, my. Without coming home. <laughs> oh my and, and I had earmarked this one passage that I wanted to read and it's just a small short paragraph okay let me get put well before Pacina she says Georgia has the most HBCUs in the nation oh my goodness that's good to wow. know now I'm yes, gonna put is. I'm gonna put you up front so that you can share your passage okay now, this is when they were just uh, ending their first tour, which started out along the route of the Underground Railroad. This leg of the tour proved to be one of the most grueling of their trips, as it encompassed 98 days, 41 towns, and 68 concerts. I mean, that's oh my a goodness. Lot of they came home with strep. Uh, not strep, t tuberculosis was big then, and uh, a lot of them lost their vocal cords. Their clothes had torn to shreds. Because remember, they're not on a Beyonce tour. Right. They were being clandestinely <laughs> taken into basements, dampened, rat-infested basements for lodging. The abolitionists did the best they could to provide housing. But once some of the town folk found out that they were harboring these black children when they came, then they start to, to threaten the white abolitionists. So a lot of times they just stayed at the train station. <laughs> wow. And, and now the Admiral fell in one of the other spots that, that, that I visited in Baltimore. That was one of their stops. You can still see where the train tracks were that came right up to the hotel. The Admiral fell in still exists. And it's still called the Admiral Bell Inn. They lodged there. They lodged at Captain Simeon's Potter House out on Rhode Island. And it's still there. It's a bed and breakfast. So there's places that we can go and still feel their spirit. Oh um, how many of us have walked across the Jubilee Bridge? Now, okay. Where is the Jubilee Bridge? Is, is it in Tennessee? Lee. It's in Tennessee, and it leads from the downtown area. You walk over the bridge, and you're on Fisk campus. Okay. Um, I was researching uh, because you know I, I had a low, a no to low budget production back in California. I mean, it just, it was just myself and my husband financing it. So we did a lot of things with uh, backdrop and the film projector, and so I needed a backdrop for a river to depict the scene where Ella Shepard was being drowned in the river. And I went on the internet and swiped through a few pictures and I came across one and something in my heart said, this is what the river looked like. So that's the picture I chose. So I started to read further. And as I read, I realized it was a river outside of Queen Victoria's castle. Oh and my. they just named it that year to the Jubilee River. And wow. those are the types of things that happen that let me know that I am walking in the realm of my destiny. Yes. 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 That it is just good. amazing. And the really way you fun. tell the story is so beautiful. It is so beautiful it the way you articulate story. what your passion is. You can feel it. You can feel it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I really do. And I can't wait for you all to meet Maggie Porter. Maggie Porter sang Handel's Cantata of Esther, the lead role. And when you sing the lead role in an opera, you are a diva. That is where the term diva comes from. So in the 1800s, Maggie Porter was already a diva. And Maggie was not for riding segregated buses and trains. And, you know, once they threw the Jubilee Singer, the women, off of the train. That what? historically happened. And fictionally, it was because Maggie Porter, <laughs> fictionally, Maggie Porter was involved in that. Maggie Porter was so, she was so avid on being treated properly. She was the last surviving Jubilee Singer. She was living in Detroit. 
and Fitz asked her to come lend her hand because uh, from from what I hear, Fitz is always having financial issues to come lend her, her her voice and her pen to the university. Maggie insisted and wrote into whatever contract she had that they sent a car for her to Detroit to pick her up to bring her to Nashville when they, whenever she came, and that's some five hundred miles. I said, "You go, Maggie." Wow. So these children's backstory, the way I wrote the story, it is ed it's educational, <laughs> it's entertaining, and it's empowering. So where can people <laughs> get your book? I am on Amazon.com. Okay. If you search the story of Jubilee, you have to add the tag and epic tale because there are a lot of uh, versions of people who've written things about Jubilee, even though the context may be different. Or you can uh, email me at the story of jubilee at gmail.com and I can okay. send one directly to you, which will save okay. you some money. Yeah. Okay, you hear that listening audience? You can get her book on That's Amazon right. or you can email her and she will send it to you. And the email is the story of jubilee at gmail.com. It's yes. scrolling here. So contact her. Fuchina, she said, I didn't realize how ignorant I was to my history until I got to St. August, August, Augustine College in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is another historical black college. And you talked about how Fisk um, were, was suffering financially. Every black college has suffered financially. And we don't we have to. We don't have to. A production like this can bring them all up. This can be ours. This can you be ours. You hear that? <laughs> you know, and 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 what I like is that when um when 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 the children they made one hundred and seventy two dollars in seven years out there on that road, sent wow. every penny back to this. And Jubilee Hall on that campus is the first brick and mortar building built for our education in the South because they just, they were just having school in the old army, you know, abandoned Union Army forts and things like that, and tents. So that, that, you know what, you go downtown Nashville and any day, any time of day, droves and droves of people. Mostly, I'm sure they're 98% tourists because locals don't usually enjoy their own cities. Millions of dollars just passing by all day long, going to the honky tonk, up on the rooftops, honky tonk music coming out of every building. And then there's the beautiful brand new African American Museum. I don't even think they notice it's there. They stop wow. in front of the museum to take a picture of the mural across the street of all of the uh, country western A listers. They someone painted a beautiful mural, or they go across the street and they're they can see the museum, but they're over there to take a selfie with these country westerners. We need this at that museum. Make it where that's the only place you can come see it. Well, see you know, I'm, I'm, I have some thoughts in my head um, regarding some things um, that might be a ver very much benefit to you, um, especially with the emphasis on historic black colleges and universities. Um, this is going to happen. And while, while you see, you know, the focus being in Tennessee, I see the focus being in every location of the HBCUs, first of all, you know, yes. it can yes. be a fundraiser for every yes. HBCU in the country. Help me put a it out there, Vera. Yes, That's my a, vision. That's what I think. A traveling tour yes. across the country supporting HBCUs. Yes. I guarantee you that door my is going to open. My gift to the universe. The, ju the Pitch Jubilee Sing gift to me and my gift to the universe. It's going to happen. And then the legacy will forever be preserved. Because you know what? If we don't watch it, <laughs> they're going to wipe our legacy all in. You never well, know we even existed. Well, they're, try slaves. they're trying to do that with the voting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they're trying to keep people of color from voting. I'm telling you, we're in a in a very dire situation right now. 
And wake up, wake up, wake up. We cannot allow what's happening to happen. We can't. Okay. And and look, we're not even allowed to go into church and worship together anymore. This is a very scary time, but it we is. can overcome it and we can. Yes, we can. We've overcome, we've overcome everything else. We can yes. overcome this as well. Yes. You know, but and we, we can gotta, find about we COVID, but Broadway together. is open and doing business. So, so, you know, if Broadway can be open, we can follow the same rules and precautions. You know, I had a friend who had an affirmation. I have everything I need to get the things I want. And I have everything I want to get the things I need. All I, I need is love I it. Behind That's I what I need. Well, it's going to happen. I, I, I know. It. It's going to happen. And before... As a matter of fact, let, uh, go ahead. I was going to um, run your, your video again before okay. we before we end, but what were you getting ready to say? Um, you know, I, I lost my thought. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Felicia says there is about 100 black towns that were taken or destroyed. Most are under lakes, some parks throughout America. The story behind Lake Lanier was once Osbertville, Georgia, is actually pretty eerie. Lake Lanier was created in 1957 in order to flood the area to make the lake. The U.S. government displaced mm-hmm. over 700 black families and had to relocate 20 cemeteries, including the bodies, but they didn't manage to move all of the grave sites. Shaking my head. And the thing Me is, too. there's been a lot of things that have happened at Lake Lanier. Um, drownings and things of that nature. But that was a black city. You know, it breaks that my young heart. Lady sounds very, that young lady sounds very oh, she's in awesome. She's awesome. Very interesting history. Yes, and she's also a personality on the same platform that I'm on. So I really appreciate her coming on. I appreciate her giving this wealth of knowledge because it ties in with what we're talking about. Um, It's just so critical. But um, before I, before we end, I want to do this. I want to do your video one more time. And then um, we're going to come back and talk some more because I put it on at the top. So I want others to see this. Thank you. Awesome. You know, I did I figured that out and did it myself. (laughs) You did that yourself? Oh my God, it's awesome. So I'm I'm real proud to see that. And I love I love your 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 platform and your format. I'm just so happy to see that we're not getting left behind with this technology. No, we're not. All the success. Well, I just, I want to see this all over the country. I really, really do. I am with you on that. That's how I see it. And I mean, this is some powerful stuff. And um, I know someone right now that's doing some major things with HBCUs. And I want to connect the two of you. Let's see. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. Because they have all the assets right there on campus. You have you have actors and singers and 
people to build. Oh, that would even and... be awesome. Oh my God. Yes. Oh, you need is for Jesus. I can't wait to see it. Yes. Felicia, so, let's try to get in here in Atlanta. Yeah. Okay. You know what? The first the first ones will gonna are gonna be the ones to set the set the pace. But and I'm ready. Friends, I, you know what? My husband a, and I invested in an RV so that we can be wherever we need to be, whenever we need to be there. That and is so, so awesome. And so see, there tell are me ten, and, there. and why not start here in Georgia? Because there are more HBCUs in Georgia than anywhere else in the nation. You can well, you know here. what I'm going to do, Vera? I'm going to uh, come up with a promotional package and I'm going to uh, refer them to this podcast. And, <laughs> and and that's right. If you need to, if you want us to see who we are and just, and then, you know, get myself a meet and greet. Yes, and let's get, yes, let's get absolutely. It absolutely. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Felicia says, yes, Atlanta, Atlanta. I'm so okay. excited. Well, tell Felicia, I'm, excited. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna need her help to show me around because it's, yes. you said she is in Atlanta, huh? Oh yeah, she's here. She's one of the, she's a personality on this platform as well. I see, okay. And so, awesome. Well, that's I'm, what I'm going to do. I'm going to reach out to all of my HBCUs and, and try to pick some interest and first come first sir i'm telling you there's oh my goodness i'll tell you after this show is over but i am so excited because what you are doing is every child every african-american family needs to see this story and and hbcus what better place then exactly. to do it through HBCUs. Oh my God, I'm yeah. so I am excited about this. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, you just gave me a whole new perspective because I had reached out to them uh, before. I, you know, sometimes you reach out and you're not ready, and that's why you know things don't work out because the universe knows you're not even ready. You reaching out, somebody may say yes, and then you'll find out you're not ready. But I am so ready now. You see how when you ask me, do you have a video? Yes, I have a video. Yes. Do you have a CD? Yes, I have a CD. You know, and you know, and the the beauty of it when you said that each HD HBC H each college or university could develop their own cast yes. for it, or they already have, they have, Atlanta, they have already. how many how many casts? members are in in this play it's eight, 18 total because nine of them are singers slash actors the singers are the cast the actors and then the other nine are peripheral and then some some parts double up like eden played two parts uh and uh, some of the other cast members the supporting cast played the cast plays several parts because you just need them in one scene here one scene there or their past service spy i even involved the community uh, for like for the scene where the young man's family was so there were nine that woman had nine children he just was the youngest so oh, I like wow. to involve the community because you bring in a child now you got grandmama granddaddy aunt uncle the guy. <laughs> wow and you bring the community in you get your pastors to play a part you can bring everybody in and everybody's yeah. contributing to making it happen oh man this and everybody is just... can celebrate the success together this is so awesome. This is yes. so awesome. We've got I have 30 needed, seconds. I have been and I just need to, to get the opportunity. Yes. And Diane, she says, hey, hi there. Sorry I'm late. Well, you can catch the replay. This was a powerful show. Um, Thank you. Talking about our history and talking about, you know, the things that we have to take responsibility for and do for ourselves. No one is going to do for us what we are not willing to do for ourselves. Exactly. And, exactly. and so that's something that I want us to really consider and take into consideration. Oh, now I remember what, what I was going to tell you. It was so powerful. I was feeling a little discouraged and at that fork in the road, should I turn back the other day? And I went outside and I prayed. And I came back inside and I had a text message. 
And it said that somebody from Walmart was texting me. And I knew I didn't have any business with Walmart for them to be texting me. But so you know how the auto spell will mess you up. So I wouldn't listen to the voicemail. And it was the young lady who had, had signed on, Barbara, Barbara Hall. That instead of Walmart, it was Barbara Hall had called me and said, I'm sorry, I met you back in July, she said, on the Fisk campus. And I just realized I hadn't returned your call. Because I, when I went out and prayed, I prayed. I said, Lord, I need some publicity. She said, I don't know if I can help you, but I have a friend with a radio station. And maybe I can get her to interview you. So I did that interview yesterday. And then uh, and then Saturday, my my one of my sons, my son, play sons, called me up. And he wanted me to meet a young lady named Vera Thomas. Remember, yes. I just prayed that I needed some publicity. Wow. Well, you know and what? He hooked me up with a young lady named Vera Thomas. And when I got finished with the radio interview, Vera Thomas said, JB, I need somebody to fill in for a podcast tomorrow. <laughs> I with the see, yeah, but see, that's a I God got thing. Back, yes. And I got back to my RV, and a young lady from the Tennessee Tribune said, um, Avita Finley told me about you, and I was wondering if I could interview you for a newspaper story. You said, it's good. I'm telling you, the doors are going to open. And you know what? We ran out of time. But um, Felicia says, awesome show. Thanks, Jemima, for all that you do and will continue to do. You inspire me. Oh, how awesome. That's Listen, you know what? I know. Time. We're, it's time for us to go. <laughs> but this was so awesome. And I'm so, I just know. That the doors you know what? are going to continue to open and a way is going to be made. That's right. And you're going to be here in Atlanta doing this show. I know it. I already know. And, it. and we're going to be on the road of, of podcasting backstage. To have I all know. the shows going on. <laughs> that would be awesome, too. And I can do so, a little acting there, too. <laughs> that's all right. Okay, now. Oh, okay, that's now. Awesome. I have a wonderful scene. You'd be perfect, too. Really? <laughs> So yes, and you're gonna have to tell me how I can get one of my books to you that I can sign to you. Oh, so when we get okay. off the air, maybe you can uh, email me an address to send it to. Well, you know, I'm so getting we, ready. I'm getting ready to shut this down, but don't go okay. anywhere, okay? Don't okay. leave. <laughs> okay. Listen, audience, thank you so much for being here, and I am just elated to have had Jemima Jones, JB here yes. with us. I am just so elated. And I just want to say you guys have an awesome, awesome week. And God bless you. And we will see you next time. The Vera Thomas Show. The Vera Thomas Show. The Let's talk about it. 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 Bye bye.